Okay, so anyway, Ted, it's so wonderful to have you in Worcester, a member of the American Antiquarian Society, their connection to Worcester, but you're great to do this and really look forward to it. Thank you, Jock. What a, what a beautiful introduction. And I want to begin by thanking Jock for his friendship over quite a few years, his uh, deep knowledge of the Civil War. And I, I remember talking with him and his incredibly well-informed son, Levi, about the Civil War over a decade ago. And just all the things he does to support local history are really moving to me. And speaking to you from Rhode Island, I wanna celebrate a link that's not celebrated very often, which is the Providence to Worcester link. It is a link, it's literally a link in the Providence and Worcester Railroad. Some of you may remember, you still see the old faded kind of brown and orange railroad bridges if you're driving on Route 146 between our two magnificent metropolises. But also, you know, when New England was founded, it was founded by a bunch of dissenting Protestant theologians and their families. It was inevitable there would be further dissents among the families after, after settling here. And especially that if a kind of headquarters was established, which it was in Boston, that in the hinterlands, people would disagree with the headquarters and I just have always appreciated the Worcester to Providence link as a, as a means of expressing unhappiness with Boston and the, and the mainstream of New England culture. So, so, so happy to be speaking to Worcester tonight. It's a fantastic city. And my book, which is about a railroad uh, and about Abraham Lincoln, um, in, in no small measure derives from my experience as a, as a teenager driving around New England, going to beautiful train locations, which I, I did. I was a kind of geeky teenager and Worcester probably has the greatest train station in New England. Um, we could debate that later tonight if you want to, but I, I really think what, what Worcester has is magnificent. Providence once had a pretty good one. It's been converted into a private office building. Um, well, I, I have to say South Station is, is pretty good too. But um, and anyway, I was a teenager growing up in New England in the 70s and loved trains and always wanted to write a book about the energy of the railroad back in the 19th century when trains had energy. And my career, as, as Jock mentioned, took me um, in some unusual directions. I, I, I always studied American history. Um, I majored in an under, undergraduate, and then I, I got a PhD graduate. And then I taught for a while. Um, and then in a very unlikely turn of events, I became a speechwriter for President Bill Clinton for about four years. Uh, in his second ad administration. And yet I always wanted to go back to those earlier historical uh, impulses. I, 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 I wanted to write about the things I'd cared about as a, as a teenager. And um, during my years as a speechwriter, Lincoln of course was all around me. Lincoln is everywhere in the White House. Um, Lincoln bedroom of course, and, and Lincoln mem Memorial. Um, in my years in, in Washington, Gary Wills' great book, Lincoln at Gettysburg, came out, which really focused with um, great acuity on, on the words of the Gettysburg Address. So I, I had Lincoln in my crosshairs. And over, as the years went by, I, I, my, my desire to write about Lincoln grew. And my memory of my railroad upbringing stayed with me. And in 2010 and, and, and 11, it all came together. The New York Times started an online history series called Disunion that later led to the publication of two books. And I was, I was very involved both in writing and in recruiting other writers to write about the Civil War um, during the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. 
And in January, February of 2011, I, I was following Lincoln and I realized there was this tremendous story that had not been written about very well. Uh, the story of Lincoln getting on a train, Springfield, Illinois, and going on a winding route through the Midwest and the, and the um, North, uh, upstate New York, through New York City, uh, Trenton, Philadelphia, Baltimore, ultimately to Washington to, to become the president of the United States. And I realized it was a very rich story for a retelling. It was um, a, a, a period only 13 days long in which Lincoln is growing a lot as a, a giver of speeches. It's a period in which he's seeing a lot of America. He's, he's looking at the window of the train and going through all these fascinating cities that are all different from each other and reaching out to Americans at a crucial time when he needed to build support, when he, he was actually pretty weak politically, despite having won the pr presidency. And I thought by describing a train journey, I could do something a little new. I, I could show Lincoln in motion in a way that he isn't usually described. He's usually seen in the White House or in, in a black and white photograph by Matthew Brady. And I thought by putting him on this train, I could make him come to life a little bit more. Um, I, I was aided by a few helpful facts. Um, there, there were several assassination attempts on Lincoln during this train ride. One, a very serious one in Baltimore on the, the last day of, of his trip and a, a couple others also. So Lincoln's life is in danger throughout the trip and that, that helped. It helped as a writer of a book to have a protagonist in danger. And I, I thought a lot about the writing of a history book with this book. I, as Jock mentioned, I've written other books. I have to be honest with you, I, I was a slow learner and my earlier books were pretty pretty hard slogs, you know? I don't know how else to describe them. They were just dutiful works of history that pretty few people would ever want to read. But then this, this book came along and something about it grabbed me. And, and I had a fascinating protagonist who is not always right. He makes mistakes and he has dark moods and light moods. And and yet he's a charismatic hero and that, that helped my, my book. And then to have him in motion helped and to have people trying to kill him helped and to having the entire experiment of American democracy hanging around his shoulders for 13 days, which I believe it was, that helped a lot. So basically my desire to write a book about Lincoln turned into a kind of, um, remarkable joyride in which for 13 days, the president elect of the United States is trying, well, he's riding a roller coaster. He's trying to get to Washington to become the president over incredible odds. People trying to kill him, party allies who are not his allies, um, a, a whole lot of people who voted against him crowds spilling out of control, bad crowd management in every city he went through, welcoming committees accidentally firing cannons into the train as it's coming into a small town. And it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of nightmare that Lincoln has to survive to perpetuate the beautiful experiment of American democracy begun in Philadelphia in 1776. And by coincidence, he has to go through Philadelphia, one of his last stops before getting to Washington. So it felt cinematic to me. It felt like someone who was wrestling with his own identity, wrestling with all of American history, moving through time and space, going backwards in history in a lot of ways, 
and then ultimately going to this city that is very, very dangerous for him, Washington, D.C., where there are a lot of people trying to kill him. And in fact, he, he would be killed in Washington four years later. But the fact that he made it in 1861 guaranteed that a new kind of president would come in and that was desperately needed in 1861. And my own grief, I have a lifelong grief over the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I, I wrote a paper on it in eighth grade and my grief was assuaged considerably by learning that he evaded the assassination that was so likely to happen in 1861. And by evading it, he basically got his presidency. And by getting his presidency, all of us got America back. America was fading. Uh, things were not looking good in 1859, 1860. And Lincoln's success in coming in against great odds and claiming his pr presidency made a new beginning possible. And he celebrates the idea of a new beginning in the Gettysburg Address, but I think he was already thinking about it on the train ride in. And the new beginning obviously involved a reckoning with slavery and with a situation that had never been entirely democratic, a South that had been given um, over representation because of the three fifths clause of the con con constitution. And I argue in the book, uh, a lot of over representation because of the location of the capital of the United States. And I think that Alexander Hamilton, as much as I admire him, gave away too much when at a dinner party in 1790, a dinner party about which we still know very little, he and James Madison and Thomas Jefferson agreed to trade Congress's approval of Hamilton's financial system, create credit for the United States with Hamilton's willingness to let the capital go to the banks of the Potomac River. But that was a catastrophic loss for the, not, not just for the North, but for anyone who believed in freedom, human equality, democracy, all the better things that were implicit in, in the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence, that once the capital was in Washington, slavery, was very, very strong in the early Republic and could not be legislated away and could not really even be discussed very much because the South was so nervous about it. And with its bastion at, at Washington, it was really hard to change the nature of the American government, a government that did permit slavery and, and, and was thinking about the expansion of slavery. And, and it, were, it was those pressures that drew Lincoln out of his early retirement and brought him out to, to fight one more time against the citadel of slavery at Washington. And I, in my book, I, I, I liken him to other pilgrims in, in epics. Um, Lincoln as a young reader, you know, he was an interesting reader. His family was mostly illiterate, but he, he, he was able to get access to, to great books. And he read Don Quixote and Robinson Crusoe and Aesop's fables. And he loved John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And I believe he read Homer's Odyssey also. And as Lincoln started this presidential train trip, I, th I think those thoughts were with him about a, a kind of soldier of virtue trying to penetrate an evil citadel. I, I have to pause for a second and say, I watched a lot of Harry Potter with my, my son, in, Freddie in the 90s and the early 21st century. And some of those thoughts were with me, but, um, Lincoln 
to become president had to penetrate a number of defenses of a citadel for slavery that was very, very well defended. And we all know what a great president he became as president. But in this book, I tried to describe how hard it was for him to even make it to Washington over geographical and political obstacles that were formidable. And he did it brilliantly. He, he spoke off the cuff over and over again. He, he explained himself to the American people. He gave formal speeches that were good. He gave informal speeches that were even better. And he rebuilt the bridges of democracy that were so crucial at a time when democracy was at a low ebb by just reaching out to people in town after town, city after city, on this winding route through the north, the upper Midwest and the north, he reforged the links between citizens that are at the heart of our democracy. So by the time he arrives in Washington on February 23rd, 1861, he's much more of a president elect than he had been when he got on the train um, on February 11th. So um, that's a lot and I'm happy to talk about what the train meant to Americans in 1861. I'm, I'm happy to talk about Lincoln as a work in progress. I'm happy to talk about all the ways in which the South was making it really difficult for the North even before secession. Um, secession was like part 10 in a, in, a, in a drama that was already happening. So any, any way I can answer any questions, I'm, I'm delighted to. And I'm just grateful to Jock and Joe for the chance to talk to you. Oh, excellent. So, you know, one of the things that I'm not going to ask a question right now, but one thing that I think we can do is um, rather than doing the chat, um, Ingrid suggested that we can all just kind of unmute if you have a question and we can just sort of start more of a discussion if that works for, um, for you all rather than having to, uh, to write anything in the chat. So um, if that works for you, that would be uh, great. Excellent. So yeah, just, uh, just feel free to unmute Ellen. Can you, Ellen, well, we can't, we can't hear you. Ellen, can you unmute, unmute yours? <laughs> can we unmute her? I don't know. Sam, do you know how to, can you unmute Ellen? Well, she looks Ellen unmuted looks like she's end. unmuted, but we can't hear her. Oh, oh, that's funny. Try again, Ellen. No. Huh. Huh. Um, tell Ellen to type her question and I'll... All right. So Ellen, if you could type your question, maybe you will need to use the chat. <laughs> but we're waiting with bated breath. Or sign language. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, I'm just going to get a charger because I'm very low. So I'll, I'll be back in about 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> See, this is great. This is why we all love we'll get, Zoom. We'll get right? Ellen time to type her question. That's right. And in the meantime, Ellen can type her question. So that's great. Like your kindergarten class would be right now, Joe. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Everyone be, would be disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, Trey, that I, I I was very glad not to have to be teaching kindergarten over Zoom, but <laughs> oh, right. So now it looks like Ellen may have done it, right? So we're waiting for Ted. Oh, that's okay. 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 I'm back. I'm back. Hey, welcome. <laughs> we can try to answer. I yeah. will convey Ellen's question as the Excellent. chat lady. Um, so Ellen is saying or asking 
could you say more about Lincoln's speechifying and how it developed on the train? Oh, I yes, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he, um, Lincoln was very well organized and he wrote out one speech for every day of the trip. But then as the trip started, there were 20, 30, 40 speeches a, a day he had to give. He had to improvise constantly. He had to go stand on the back of the train and, and greet farmers coming around or big crowds in, in, in towns. And so he, he grew, he, he was evolving a lot. And by the end of this, the, the trip, um, he comes through Philadelphia on the last day he had a very highly evolved sense of what he wanted to say to the American people. And that included his feelings about the Declaration of Independence. And by a stroke of genius, he came into Independence Hall in Philadelphia on, on, on Washington's birthday in 1861 and gave a beautiful speech about what the Declaration of Independence meant to him and by extension to all people. So he really grew a lot over the 13 days of, of the trip. Uh, Ingrid? Hi, can, you, can you hear me? Oh, there's John, yay. Carol's okay. got a question, I think. Oh, okay, go ahead, John. Oh. Well, or, or whoever. Uh, yeah, uh, my question is, uh, Ted, whether you have um, Caught up, I'm sure you have, with Shakespeare in America, because I was surprised by uh, um, how much Lincoln um, loved Shakespeare. And <clears throat> I wonder if he was quoting from the plays along the, the train ride. <laughs> Lincoln did love Shakespeare. I don't know that he quoted from Shakespeare on the train ride. There are moments later in his presidency where he quotes Shakespeare very, very beautifully. And it's funny, I just wrote a piece which maybe I can make available to Joe and Jock about Lincoln's reading of Shakespeare. So it's funny you asked me that. But the technical answer on the train ride, I don't see a lot of Shakespeare, but later when he's president, there is a lot of Shakespeare. He talks a lot about him. He, Shakespeare's words um, are present in, in his famous speeches and in his not so famous speeches. So Lincoln is a very devoted Shakespeare reader. It's, it's, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Ted, can you hear yep. me? Yes, I can. Um, you, Ellen had asked about the speechifying on the train and, and I thought you said you, he, that he did 20 to 40 speeches a day. So did he have a, a, a speech for the day that he changed as he moved, to, moved from one town to the other or did he give different speeches in each place? I think 20 to 40 a day is about right. Maybe more like 20 than 40, but yeah, he gave a lot of speeches. Um, they were very short speeches from the back of a train. I mean, this was, you know, basically the first whistle, talk, whistle stop tour. Mm -hmm. And he would say a couple of light words and he had a few jokes he liked to say, like, um, you wanted to see me and I wanted to see you. And I think, I got the best of the bargain. <laughs> um, you know, he was funny, um, but most of those speeches were very short, just like one minute long off the back of a, of a train as he's coming through a, a small town. Um, but but I, I believe they were very important that he needed to reach out to a lot of Americans. He was politically pretty weak He'd only won with 39.8% of the vote. And so he was building up his support as he went through every tiny town on the, on the way to Washington. Thank you. Yep. Ted, can you elaborate a little bit about the nature of the assassination attempts during the trip? Sure. Um, there are 
two half-baked attempts and then a, a very serious attempt. So may, maybe three in all. Um, on the first day, train was going pretty fast out of Springfield heading toward Indiana. And they found uh, a device on the track that would throw the train off the track. Is that an assassination attempt? It's hard to say, but it, it, it was certainly disturbing, but it could have been teenagers nearby also. In, in Cincinnati, a couple days later, uh, a, an explosive device was placed in his car before the train left, left Cincinnati. Pretty serious uh, problem. And they, they found it and they got rid of it and the train kept going. The, the worst one was a, a very serious plot around Baltimore, Maryland to kill him as he was transferred from, Baltimore had three different train stations and he would come in to one, the President Street station and then be transferred by horse and carriage to another, the Camden Street station to go to Washington. And in that transfer, a mob of about a thousand people were going to surround him and, and shoot him and stab him and set off ex explosive devices. And they had ships waiting in Baltimore Harbor to get away. And that plot was exposed by very good detective work. So one of the great stories that I discovered was that two women were very involved in saving Lincoln's life. And women are not usually all that present in the story of the Civil War or of Abraham Lincoln, but a, a woman who spent some time in Worcester, and I'm so glad I, I remembered to mention her name, Dorothea Dix. Wow, yes. <laughs> the great Dorothea Dix, a mental health reformer in the 19th century, was often traveling around the country to help each state build its own facility for treating the mentally unwell. And she was coming up th through the South in the fall of 1860 as Lincoln was elected. And she came through South Carolina and somehow she picked up some bits of intelligence that were incredibly important. She found out that there was a serious attempt to kill Lincoln on his train trip into Washington. And that young men were already walking around looking at railroad bridges in much the way when we heard about Gretchen Whitmer last week, um, the militias were going around looking at bridges to, to try to detonate explosives under, underneath them. And same thing was happening. And she being, the kind of person she was, strong, strong, confident woman from Massachusetts. She didn't ask anyone for advice. She just dealt with it. She just went to the, the one person who could do something. And that was the head of the railroad that went from Philadelphia through Baltimore to Washington. He was also from Massachusetts. His name was Samuel Felton. He was from West Newbury. <coughs> kind of near Newburyport, Lowell and Lawrence. And um, he recognized the threat for what it was. He, he agreed with her and he sent for a good railroad detective he knew named Ellen Pinkerton, who was based in Chicago, who came out, brought eight detectives with him, including a br brilliant female spy named Kate Warney, who imitated a Southern woman and went into the, 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 the assassination conspiracy in Baltimore. She just found the people who were in the middle of it, imitated a Southerner, was accepted and got all the information. And then she was sent by Pinkerton to intercept Lincoln on his train, tri tra train ride, tell him about the, the danger. But without Dorothea Dix first and Samuel Felton none of that would have happened and Lincoln would have been going blind into basically, um, you know, a, a, a shooting gallery in, in Baltimore that I doubt he would have come out of. So Dorothea D 
Dix, a quasi Worcesterite, saved Lincoln's life, and by saving Lincoln, saved American history. Yeah, that's <laughs> no Worcester. That's remarkable. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm I'm looking at the chat, folks, and there's a question here from John Sca Scanlon to Ted. Um, did Lincoln write all of his own speeches or did he have any assistance? And number two, who was the first president to have a speech writer? Uh, great questions. Lin Lincoln wrote almost all of his speeches. The first inaugural was a very, very important speech. He was trying to keep the South in the country and he shared pieces of that speech with some friends in Illinois and also with William Henry Seward from upstate New York, who was his, well, he, he was his rival. He's in, in the book, Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin, someone who wanted to be the president. But then he's becoming Lincoln's chief advisor and he will be the secretary of state to Lincoln and Seward was a very good writer also. And so Lincoln had drafted the first draft of the first inaugural, showed it to Seward and Seward proposed a final paragraph and his thoughts were good, but Lincoln's were even better. So Lincoln reworked what Seward sent him and it became you know, one of the greatest paragraphs in our tradition of oratory. I, mean, I, I don't know what is better, but um, all the lines about better angels, they, they, they were from Lincoln's reworking of what Seward sent to him. So, so Lincoln was smart enough to take advice now and then from, some, from someone who knew how to give it, but mostly he wrote his own speeches. The Gettysburg Address, I think is entirely his. Second inaugural, I think it's entirely his, but First inaugural, he took a little help from William Seward and also from some friends in Illinois. So there was a number two to that question, which was, well, I guess he did have a speech writer, but- Oh yeah, the first one. Yeah. We have heard that Warren Harding had a speech writer named Judson Welliver. And so there's now a Judson Welliver Society of former presidential speechwriters. So we usually give that guy the credit, but um, I think there were earlier people helping presidents. They've, they've needed help for a long time. Okay, here's a long question from Rebecca Dresser. Okay. History doesn't repeat itself, but there are patterns. Oh, he's leaving. <laughs> this is too hard a question. Don't take it personally. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. You did it. Yeah, I was like. <laughs> I, could, I could hear all of it. Okay. It's impossible not to see a pattern being repeated here. If the Civil War was a period of political realignment, are we going through a similar phenomenon now? <laughs> How much were you thinking about our current situation when you were writing this book? This would be a wonderful movie. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't thinking about our current, I, I just was thinking about Lincoln. But then as it all happened, it felt incredibly relevant and it still does, including the transition we're coming up not only to an election, but a transition. And Lincoln's transition was very hard, November and December. He had won, but it wasn't clear the South would let him become president. And I'm worried about those same pressures today. So I, I did not anticipate it, but, but I'm grateful that it, it does feel so relevant. I think that's giving the book an extra boost uh, in, in the winter of 2020 to 21. And God knows where we're all going. I'm, I'm knocking on wood as I'm speaking to you. And I, I hope that we can do what we are supposed to do as Americans, which is have a democratic election that produces a winner. But I'm, I'm worried it won't be as easy as that. 
Um, but to the question of did I anticipate that? No, I did not. But it's great for the book. Uh, <laughs> a tragedy for, actually I have a question sort of for both Becca and for, um, for Ted. Uh, Ted, Becca uh, is a history professor at Hunter College, but also teaches uh, in a high security Bedford Hills, I think, uh, uh, women's prison teaches American history. And Ted, I think you're doing things with Van Gorian about bringing history back into the public in a certain sense. Yeah. It's kind of interesting if you both kind of had, especially in terms of Becca, your experience with the prisoners, um, that you know the, the, the importance and value and potential and problems in terms of of teaching history and bring it alive to, to all of us uh, civilians. Well, not in jail necessarily. So, so, Jock, what is the question? Yeah. The question is sort of what do we do about making history? And you think of all the STEM stuff and humanities getting pushed out and what have you. And history is a really important, obviously, discipline. And I don't know if U.S. history is even required in high school anymore. It is in some most places, but just. How do you, you know, there are scholars that do history, there are, you know, people that are kind of curious to read about it, but, you know, what is, what is the future of, uh, of history for, um, you know, again, civilians, not just scholars? That's a heavy question. Um, we, we need somehow to come back to the idea that we have one American history. Um, we're so divided right now. We have, I mean, we've all seen the statues coming down all summer and I have mixed feelings about that. I'm actually conservative in a lot of ways. And I, I uh, only about four nights ago, Lincoln's statue was pulled down in Portland, Oregon. And I, I, I strongly disapprove of that. And I, I mostly disapprove of all of the tearing down of statues without a proper civil process, you know? I, I think even if there's there are grounds for anger the way American history has been taught, we want to have a civil process to think think about it and not just go out in the middle of the night and tear things down. So um, we need to get back to one history, and it will not be easy, and 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 that includes things like the 1619 project of the New York Times, which remains controversial a year after it was written. And I share feelings of, um, of hesitation about that project. I, I, I loved the passion with which it was written and I, I loved 90% of what I read, but then I, I read things that I thought were historically inaccurate. Um, that the American Revolution was fought to perpetuate slavery. I don't think that's true. Or that Abraham Lincoln was a racist. I don't think that's true. So, so we need to get back to one story if we can. It's very, very hard. And in, in a country like ours that celebrates diversity, it's especially hard to, to find a monolithic narrative. But I do think it's important. And so the task before us over the next th two weeks is just to get through an election, but then I, I, I hope there will be a deep rethink at the American Antiquarian Society and other similar institutions about what the beginnings meant, what, what, what was included and what was ex excluded in the beginnings of American history and how we can forge a truly national narrative going forward that includes people from red states as, as well as blue states, because I don't think we can sustain this model of two different Americas coexisting at the same time, extremely uncomfortable with each other, even hating each other. We, we need to get back to the idea of one country building a democracy in which everyone can, can play a part. I think I saw something else from Ellen Moore, but I'm not positive. 
Ellen? <laughs> <laughs> it was a raising of a hand. <laughs> um, I have a quick question for you, Ted. Um, this is kind of a from the sublime to the ridiculous, but how how involved were you in the actual making of this book? Because it's really a beautiful book. Thank you, Joe. Um, <laughs> very, I, I was very involved. Um, one reason I, I, I I'm grateful to Simon and Schuster. Well, and and I, I want to begin by saying I had a, a, a had a beautiful editor who died in February, Alice Mayhew, and I want to keep thanking her for what she meant to me. She meant the world to me, but um, she disciplined me and, and helped me avoid my tendency to write run on sentences and, and paragraphs about everything interesting. But I also, I wanted to make it a visual book and I thought a, a book about a train trip and I haven't quite mentioned the train, how important it is to me I mentioned the Providence and Worcester Railroad, but but the train is really important in this book. And I wanted it to be a book in which the reader can look out the window of the train with Lincoln. And so I wanted illustrations on almost every page of the book. And to my amazement, Alice and Simon and Schuster let me get away with that. And I'm I'm still not quite sure how I how I got away with that, but um that to me was a huge, huge positive that if it had been a dense history book with a little inset section of illustrations in the middle, it, it would not nearly have been as, as good as the, the way they, they laid it out. And I also am very grateful to a map maker based in New Haven who did a beautiful map in the end papers. And yeah. Jock, Jock is a maker of books, so he will appreciate how important end papers are, but um, but you're talking to Ingrid, who is the real maker of the book. So she's the <laughs> colleague in Tidepool that I whose tail I you know I was uh, <laughs> coattails I grab onto that makes our books beautiful. Well, I, I'm a harsh critic, and I I've been flipping through this book, and it's just spectacular. Oh, thank you, Joe. Yeah, and the and the end papers um, are really beautiful. I mean, that's an extraordinary I, map. Uh, if any of you ever want a map made, uh, my friend Connie Brown in New Haven is a genius. She's just an incredible, she's, she's an artist who draws maps. Interesting combination. And, and her, her studio is called Redstone Studios. You can look it up online. She, she was the artist who made the end papers. Okay, good to know. Okay, I'm looking at another question here. Um, as I was babbling, uh, the first question is from Elizabeth Liz Johnson. And she's saying, I disagree with your assessment of the 1619 project. We do not need to be unified at this point because the stories of African Americans have been hidden for hundreds of years. Did you disagree with the stories of the black farmers who could not get loans to run their farms? Uh, no, I, oh. I didn't disagree with any of the parts of the project that brought black history out of the shadows and into the, the limelight. That was all great. What I disagreed with were the, what I believe were the false statements about the American Revolution and about Abraham Lincoln. So in, in the drive to present a unified narrative, the authors of that project said that the American Revolution was fought to perpetuate slavery, which, hey, if you're from Worcester, just mm -hmm. read any account of any farmer from central Massachusetts about why they were fighting the American Revolution. It was not to preserve slavery. And the account of Lincoln, 
It's only one story told. It's of a kind of quasi-racist moment in which Lincoln meets a group of black people and wonders if they might consider colonization to, to another part of the world. And it's it's not untrue that it happened, but it's it is untrue to present only that story and not the story of someone wrestling at the very same moment with the problem of how to get emancipation through a Congress that doesn't really want to do it and who is putting a whole lot of its presidency around emancipation and is beginning to turn the Civil War into an effort to end slavery. And it just felt to me like a huge blind spot historically. So no, I'm all for what the question says about bringing more focus to black history, but but don't don't misrepresent the American Revolution and, and Lincoln in, in the service of that cause, because the cause is great enough without misrepresenting those other things. The cause is great. African Americans have been extraordinary players in American history from the very beginning. And should we celebrate them more? Absolutely. But we do not need to denigrate the American Revolution or Abraham Lincoln as, as part of that cause. Okay. Um, here's a question from Bill Bagley. In the spirit of your comment, Ted, about the outfall of the election, I think of the second inaugural and Lincoln's call for malice towards no, towards none and charity for all. Do you think that Lincoln was aware of the impact of his speeches? Absolutely. He knew who he was. He was the president of the United States. Um, he absolutely knew he was speaking to the entirety of the American people, North and South and to the entirety of the American people for all time. He was very aware of what he was saying. I'm, I'm seeing in the chat a, a comment that he, the 1619 Project did not denigrate Lincoln. It, it did, just read it. It, it absolutely did. Yeah, there's comments here, but I'm trying to decipher the questions. Um, I'm just telling you it denigrated Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, so Becca Dresser, do you want me to read your question here? Hold on. <laughs> okay. These Sorry. are long. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a loud mouth. <laughs> okay. Okay, Ted, your book gives us hope that the good guys who believe in the fundamental ideals of equality can still win. David Blight had a short piece in the New York Review of Books likening the Confederacy to our current Republican Party as a dangerously divisive faction that could end democracy. Do you agree? Yes, I do. <laughs> I think we're in a perilous moment. Um, you know, I'm. I'm alternating between what might appear to be a conservative position about respecting Lincoln and then what might appear to be a liberal position about disrespecting the current president. Um, but I think we are in a perilous moment and I'm worried about November and December. And I think that, I think Joe Biden will probably win. We, we, we'll see two weeks away and who, who knows. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty worried about Donald Trump's unwillingness to leave office, including the fact that he's legally in, in great peril, which might drive his desire to stay in office. So I, I, I think we're heading for some hard weeks and we need to think hard about what binds us together, including the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and Lincoln's speeches and Franklin Roosevelt's speeches and the experience of Americans in the two world wars and in the civil rights movement and, and all of our, our better moments, you know, the better angels that Lincoln called us to be. So 
yes, I'm, I'm very worried about where things are, are going, but I'm hoping, and, and already Americans are voting, I'm, I'm hoping the great center of this country will reassert itself and just buy some time, even if Joe Biden is a short term, I mean, who knows, I don't know, but um, just to get us back into being America again, a country that stands for values around the world and treats its people decently at home and, and tries to unite those people instead of dividing them. And I think that would be a huge step forward over the last four years. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions. I think there's a good question just pushing back a bit on the notion of a unified national history. Mm -hmm. That might be worth teasing out a bit. Where was that question? I think it's from Liz Johnson. What, what is the question? Or maybe who is it? It's, it was, the, it's it was like, from me. Yeah. I, I'm just concerned about that we have one national history. I don't see how <clears throat> um, that's possible. I, I, I think we cannot have one national history. It just seems that we have too much diversity, et cetera, within the whole history of this country to have one national history. And I would have a problem with that. Well, I respectfully want to disagree. It, it, it is with great respect, but I, I think we've built a great country and it took a long time and a lot of generations. And I love local history. I love the local history of my not very distinguished state, Rhode Island. And I love, um, I've spent a lot of my life in Massachusetts and I, I love that history. And I, I'm, whenever I meet someone from another part of the country, I wanna hear what it's like where they're from. But we are part of this extraordinary story of, of a country that was, was created, I, I would say in 1776, although, that, that is part of the question raised by 1619 is when, when did America begin? Um, but I, I would say it began with the Declaration of Independence and got better in the 19th century. It was highly imperfect for a long time. And then Lincoln made it much, much better than it had been. And then it was highly imperfect again. And Woodrow Wilson did some things. He's very unpopular now, but he, he helped to articulate America's message to the world. And then Franklin Roosevelt did a whole lot. And I believe that it is one story, that the story of all of the peoples from all of the continents who came here um, is tremendously moving. And, and, and I don't want it to be 20 different stories. I want it to be one story because one story is stronger and I want to help, you know, democracy is, is suffering in the Philippines, in Myanmar, in China, in Russia, in Belarus, um, in Hong Kong, in many parts of Europe. Um, the, the Russian activist who was poisoned by Putin in South America and if America can tell a single story, it helps all of those people, all of those advocates for self-government government in their very different places. And if we fall apart and give in to our own tendency, which is very strong to be divided, I think it helps all of those other countries to, to punish their own ethnic and religious minorities and, and to not be very democratic in their own way. So look, it's really hard and we fall apart more often than we succeed. But I, if we can build a great country and believe in ourselves and in our history in a patriotic way, to, to, I'm, I'm liberal and I'm patriotic. 
then I think we help people who believe in democracy all around the world. I guess that's, I just think it's hard for us to have one national history when we come from so many different backgrounds, beliefs, countries, Native American, slavery, uh, how we could possibly have one national history is just hard for me to understand, but maybe I'm in the minority. It's, it's a fair question. And nothing wrong with asking it, um, but I just think we're stronger when we embrace each other. You know, I have a lot of Southern friends who are wonderful. I have a lot of Western friends who are wonderful. I want to be a citizen of the of the same country that that they are, and I would like children to learn about the great history of the United States of America. I. I I love diversity, but I want it all to be part of a single story of, of, of this great country, which, you know, the, the history is amazing. The American Revolution is amazing. Civil War is amazing. The two world wars are amazing. Um, the last 20 years have been a little less amazing, a little more problematic, but I still believe Americans came here for a, a, a reason and that includes building something that works here so that people in other parts of the world can, can build something similar. And it's not because we have some God-given mission, it's because we're a pragmatic people who like diversity and like school committees and town councils and we like sharing power in ways that work that are not autocratic and if we can spread that message around the world, that, that's still a vital message in 2020. I have a, a question. May I ask by voice? Of course. Thanks. Um, my question is, is the concept of one story a, a concept that's familiar to some scholars, but a new phrase to me? Because it sounded as though um, your definition of what is one story is that it is a richly inclusive story that leaves out nobody. That is one story that includes every kind of reason to have been brought or to choose to come to North America. Um, and that is a rich and, and uh, attractive one story to me because it leaves out nobody and it includes the saddest stories and the most hopeful stories. But I feel as though growing up in the 1950s and 60s, I was taught a sort of one story that left out most of the others that might be embarrassing. And so I'm wondering if the two of you are having a difference of definition, what does one story mean? Um, but is the, the concept of one story uh, yours, and we're learning what you mean by it, which I like, or is the concept of one story common among historians and those of us who haven't been reading in that realm of conversation or just catching up with your working definition as a group? Well, that's a very profound question and, and helps, helps me because we may not be so far apart in our questions. Um, I think the questioners have wanted more representation of African Americans in, in the national story. And I, I want that too. I, I, I would never oppose that. Um, but I do still come back to thinking the USA is a single country and we want a si single story. We may have to change that story in the years going forward because there was a whole lot of messianic self-obsession and we didn't need that you know there, were, there was a lot of patting ourselves on the back and I think thinking of ourselves as, as a normal country going forward would be healthy for everybody but at the same time we are pretty good at racial diversity I think we're I'm not sure who's better than we are. We, we have flaws, to put it mildly, 
Um, I'm not sure it's better in any European country or any Asian country or any African country. We, we are pretty good at racial, in, racial and religious diversity. Um, and I think, you know, when you write a textbook, the, the, the organizing principle of, of high school education and then college is that you're studying the history of your country. You have AP or, or maybe AP exams aren't even given anymore, but you, you study American history. So we need a single narrative. And I don't think that need will disappear. I mean, I think the United States of America will be a country for a long time to come, but can we do a better job being inclusive and celebrating uh, the, the best ideas of 1619 Project and immigration and, and, and telling the story of slavery better than we have told it in the history books of the 50s and 60s and 70s? Absolutely. I think we, we should never stop trying to, to tell it better than, than we used to. Seems like there's an element of, of an aspirational kind of one story and that it's derived through this frictional process of disagreement to a certain extent and going back to the and, and inclusion. So George Bancroft, the first, uh, perhaps the first great historian of America is from Worcester. And yeah. I don't think that was an adequate history, certainly. And although it was at the time was, was sort of the history and this notion of whatever the Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Moynihan's great thing, you're sort of, you're entitled to your opinions, but not your facts. And so you kind of fight over what the facts are and you broaden them and widen them. But it's this aspirational move towards a common story, I think is what makes the process, it seems to me what makes the process of creating history uh, so important. Uh, and it would have to be tested in a way that people that are left out make their case. And then there's that intention to sort of, well, that has to be included. And so the history today is far superior in terms of a story than it was 100 and 50 years ago and has more to come probably. I actually am a big fan of George Bancroft jocks. I, I, I got a set of his books in grad school and they're, they're, they, they, read, they yeah. read very well. <laughs> I'll tell you George Bancroft's story. My great grandfather was walking on Main Street with um, uh, his son, Dan, who was about four years old and George Bancroft was walking the other way and they were cousins. And uh, George Bancroft said, could I lift this young guy? And so, yes, that was okay. And what he said was, someday he'll be able to say he was held by a great man. <laughs> Bancroft kept going. <laughs> Not a good story. No. <laughs> well, well, it's a revealing story, I would a say. revealing story. <laughs> exactly. Oh, excellent. So great. So now, is there anything else, Ingrid, in the chat? Or there's comments and things, but there's no real questions. All right. So. <laughs> well, that's one of the best things, I think, is when people uh, uh, are left with comments and things to think about, I think, yeah. is, is, is the best, best, uh, best way. And I'll tell you, it just makes me, we still have our ballots at home. We haven't voted yet, but we're, <laughs> I mean, not that there's a question, but, um, but, uh, but we got to do that tomorrow. Uh, but anyway. Um, but if that, I, I think, but this has just been thank so you. wonderful and, and, and Ted, we, uh, really, really well, appreciate Thank you. It. And I, I appreciate the intensity of the opinions. It's wonderful to speak to Massachusetts people. I, I have been a Massachusetts person. I'm, I'm currently a Rhode Island person, slightly inferior version of the same thing, but the, the intelligence you bring into the conversation is is so so re refreshing and and uh, don't don't stop we need to keep examining who we are as a country and and as a people of peoples and so um i i if you want to email me after this um joe or jock can give you my email i'm happy to keep the conversation sure. going but um this is a good good way to talk on the eve of the election. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Ted. That was wonderful. Yeah. And as well as the back and forth. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank Thank you. You. And, and so I'd love so to much. love to see you in Worcester next Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Well, 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 